Hello, and thank you for joining us as we continue the 2023 Historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip with the fifth stop on this year's adventure, the Rainey and Heim Gross Foundation in New York City. The Historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip is a collaboration between the James Castle House, operated by the Boise City Department of Arts and History, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios program, also referred to as HAWS, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. My name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I'll be your guide on this year's virtual road trip. I serve as the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. With me today is Valerie Blint, the Director of Haas, Sasha Davis, Executive Director of the Rini and Heim Gross Foundation, and providing American Sign Language Interpretation is Slavona Andrew Carson and Peter Bookland. For those of you just joining us for the very first time, I'd like to start by sharing how this program came to be and what you can expect during today's presentation. The James Castle House and Haas launched this virtual road trip in the summer of 2021, a time when travel was limited due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Longing for adventure, we found inspiration in the recently published uh, Guide to Historic Artist Homes and Studios, written by Valerie Blint. With a desire to dig deeper into these extraordinary spaces, uh, the virtual road trip was born. So fully inspired by this concept of a road trip, uh, where the journey can be just as fun as the final destination, both Valerie and I will share some travel notes before today's speaker, Sasha, presents on the live home and work of Heim Gross. At the end of this presentation, we will host a brief question and answer period. Please add your questions to the Q&A box at any time. We will also share related events, resources, and mailing lists through the chat feature. This event is being recorded and we'll, uh, will be made available online in the coming days. Along with ASL interpretation, you can access English language captions by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. So, as this is a virtual road trip, I'd like to start by highlighting a few notable attractions you might consider visiting on the journey between last month's stop, the historic Westwood site in Knoxville, Tennessee, and today's destination, the Rini and Heim Gross Foundation in New York City. This is about an 11 hour drive, so if you're making uh, this trip in real life, uh, we'd recommend breaking up your travel between two or three days at least. So traversing east along Highway 81, we're first going to stop uh, to hear the subterranean sounds of the Great Stalactite Organ, which is located within Virginia's Luray Caverns. While this organ might look like a normal instrument, uh, with of course the exception of its underground location, its keyboard is actually wired to soft rubber mallets that strike various stalactites within the Luray Cave system, uh, which stretches across 3.5 acres. So no matter where you are in the caverns, you can actually hear the music of the organ throughout. Um, leaving the cave systems, uh, we'll hop back in the car and continue toward Pennsylvania, where we'll stretch our legs and fill our stomachs on the Hershey and Harrisburg Chocolate and More Sweet Treat Trail. Uh, this is super exciting for anyone who loves sweets um, because it's a choose your own adventure multi-stop tour that offers a great way to explore this area through your taste buds. And uh, it's not just candy shops, bakeries and cafes are also listed as potential stops if you're craving something more savory to balance out all the sweets. As we approach the New Jersey and New York border, we'll explore the Van Gelder studio. Uh, it's a chapel-like space dedicated to live jazz. The building was designed by an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright and was founded by legendary sound engineer, Rudy Van Gelder. You can catch a live show, usually jazz, or tour the space to learn about this fascinating uh, past and bright future of this historic recording studio. So as we cross the Hudson River and you're our final destination at the Rini and Heim Gross Foundation, I'd like to now invite Valerie to share some of her recommendations when traveling in and around this area of the city. Thank you, Mackenzie, to you, Lavona, Peter, and everyone involved at the James Castle House for spearheading this year's virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artists Homes and Studios. And I am delighted, more than delighted, that this evening we will be talking about a site that I have had the pleasure of visiting numerous times, most recently just a couple months ago. And every time, without fail, I discover something new. 
But like many colleagues, although um, I was a New York City resident for years, this place was completely unknown to me until I came to Haas. My hope is that the magic of this place, one of the most intact artist sites in the country, uh, works its way into your hearts as well. So many artists live and work in cities, yet very few urban artist spaces are preserved for public visitation. Gross's studio serves as a touchstone back to the countless artists who lived and worked in New York, but also to the specific creative hive that was and is Greenwich Village. Like so many New Yorkers, it took me actually moving out of the city to really venture out into new neighborhoods um, beyond my own neighborhood. Greenwich Village is in so many ways a world unto itself. And the frenetic energy of artistic endeavor is present everywhere. The center of the village is Washington Square Park, only blocks away from Gross's home on LaGuardia Place. So spend some time here orienting yourself to the vibe of this part of the city. Stand under the arch erected in honor of our first president. Take in a free movie on the park's lawn in summer. Listen to the frequent and practical musical performances or the consistent clanking of skateboarders or just sit on one of the many benches and uh, people watch like I like to do. Consider staying at the Washington Square Hotel so you can be steps away from the park and only blocks away from the gross home and studio. From the moment that you enter this lobby, the lush interiors start to awaken your own inner bohemian. If these walls could talk, they would tell stories of creativity going back more than 100 years. They would whisper, perhaps you are in the room where a young Ernest Hemingway stayed, where 18-year-old Michelle Phillips co-wrote the song California Dreamin', where Bob Dylan and Joan Baez played music together, or where Bo Diddley came every time he played in NYC. Chaim Gross chose to live and work in one of New York's most vibrant artistic enclaves. But today, the former Gross home is also situated within the heart of NYU. From Washington Square, take a stroll to the Silver Towers, the trio of 30-story brutalist buildings officially known as University Village, designed by iconic modernist architect I.M. Pai. They were located in 196, they were completed in 1967, shortly after the buildings across the street. Massive twin slabs painted in alternating primary colors of bright red, blue, and yellow. In spring, cherry blossoms enliven the courtyard, but the true centerpiece is the formidable 36 foot tall concrete sculpture, Silvette, a young woman with a ponytail, one of only two outdoor Pablo Picasso sculptures in the United States. While mid-century modern architecture actually can be found in the village, it is renowned as a treasure trove of um, buildings from earlier periods. Start your immersion several blocks away of Washington Square Park at the 1832 Merchant's House Museum, the very first building in Manhattan granted historic landmark designation shortly after the Preservation Act of 1965. Take a tour and marvel at the impeccably preserved interiors and collections, including a rare collection of women's clothing and fantastic dresses to be sure, along with a vast array of accessories from hats to parasols to shoes to fans. While here, you will also learn about the Irish staff who worked in this home. And if you visit in the summer, plan to attend one of the evening musical events in the magical back garden. More architectural wonders await, each with its own compelling story. And all you need to do is walk. Every street has something interesting, but there are some truly unique gems and a few things that you should not miss when you're out on your own adventures. Maria's Crisis Cafe, a bar since the 20s, is also famous as being the terra firma where founding father Thomas Paine died in 1809. Stop in and join the crowds as they sing along in classic Broadway hits played live on the piano while you take in the walls lined with theater memorabilia. As you continue to stroll along narrow tree-lined streets, 
Buildings dating back to the late 1700s and early 1800s abound. One of the best examples of the Federalist style um, can be seen in Grove Court, a row of uh, red brick private residencies originally built by a local grocer entrepreneur uh, for housing for middle-class workmen in hopes of fostering a built-in customer base. Also nearby on Grove Street is the oldest wooden extant house in Manhattan, or check out 75 and a half Bedford Street, the narrowest house in the village. The former Jefferson Market Courthouse, a Victorian confection with signature clock tower, now serves as a branch of the New York Public Library. Take a quiet moment as you sit within Gothic-inspired splendor. If you're looking for some more modern history, have a drink or take in a show at the Stonewall Inn, the first national LGBTQ historic landmark in the nation, site of the 1969 police raids and uprising, now viewed as the beginning of the modern day gay rights movement in the United States. If you're a popular culture maven, let your wanderings lead you to the exterior film sites for Carrie Bradshaw's Brownstone in Sex in the City, or the Perry Street apartment and coffee shop from the long running Friends series. Self-guided or professionally guided tours of architecture in the village are plentiful and you really only need to search the web if you don't wanna leave it up to serendipity, which is, would be my choice. Creatives of all types have long been attracted to Greenwich Village. One of the oldest percent professional artist clubs in the nation is still located here. While it remains a private members club, the Solomon Gundy opens its doors and many of its spaces for public visitation. Take in one of the rotating contemporary exhibitions or attend a lecture in the formal parlor. The club also often exhibits historic artworks by earlier members like ceramics by Charles Volkmer. A highlight is the extensive, and I mean really extensive collection of artist palettes on display everywhere throughout this building. Back towards Washington Square, the village also boasts one of the leading artist schools in the nation, now housed in what were once a series of historic artist studio buildings. Arrange to visit the New York Studio School to take a tour of the Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney Studio, sculptor and founder of the Whitney Museum. Don't miss the exquisite details of the flame motif fireplace by Robert Winthrop Chandler and look up at the ceiling and see how the flames evolve into dra dragons and snakes above you. The former hayloft, now a window, looks out onto McDougal Alley, a private cul-de-sac which originally housed stables for nearby homes. These alley buildings were later transformed into studio spaces for several generations of artists, including Whitney, Pollock, and Noguchi. Daniel Chester French, sculptor of the Lincoln Memorial, was an early and long-standing resident and actually sold some of his property to Whitney. His summer home, Chesterwood in Massachusetts, is a member of HOG. Stay on McDougal Street and in the area and get a taste of the broader artistic traditions that have deep roots in the village. The Comedy Cellar has been a hub for laughter since the 1980s. Many famous comedians got their start by taking the mic here like Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld, and it continues to be a place that showcases new talent, and a board outside um, lets you know what it, who's on the docket on any given night. The village has long had a thriving music scene, and Cafe Wa, open since 1959, is part of rock and folk music history. Jimi Hendrix and Bruce Springsteen and many, 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 many others um, performed here early in career. And on any given night, you can enjoy jazz, rock, and soul while you sip coffee or cocktails and take in the legendary photo collage of greats who pass through this space. At either venue, you never know who might show up as a surprise guest to do a special set. If you are looking to do some stargazing, and I don't mean in the sky, consider nearby French Bistro Minetta Tavern, open since 1937. Many other unique experiences await as you venture beyond McDougal. While the big lights of Broadway may beckon, the village is actually a great place to see some of the best 
um, plays in NYSD, including developing work. Uh, one theater you might try is the Cherry Lane Theater, one of the smallest and oldest off-Broadway. Literary buffs should brunch at the White Horse Tavern, which was a haunt for writers such as Dylan Thomas. And if you are a jazz fan, like me, the Village Vanguard is a must-see, uh, one of the oldest continually operating jazz clubs actually in the world. If you're looking for something totally different, which might include some retail therapy, make a visit to C.O. Bigelow, the oldest apothecary in the United States, and step back in time. The store is filled with original fixtures, including antique display cases, but you can also select from their full line of signature beauty and fragrance products. No matter where your wanderings take you, sampling a slice of New York City pizza is a must. We locals think we have the best in the world, whether you choose from old schools such as Joe's Pizza and business since the 1970s, or more current upscale offerings like creamy artichoke and vodka Sicilian, feel free as locals do to eat on the go as you walk to your next adventure. While not strictly part of Greenwich Village, any trip to Lower Manhattan should include a visit to artist Donald Judd's Soho home and studio, which he created by restoring and converting the abandoned 19th century cast iron sewing factory. Here he combined living and workspace with furniture of his own design and artworks by himself and his contemporaries. After you visit, stay in Soho and explore the largest collection of extant cast iron architecture in the world. It's more than 250 buildings. We're gonna start to circle back towards high and growth via Bleecker Street, one of the most famous streets in all of New York City. Spend an evening at the bitter end, as I have done many times, part of Bleecker's legendary music scene. Line up, as I also have done, for a sweet treat at the Magnolia Bakery's flagship store. And then sample the wide variety of shopping opportunities, ranging from vintage record and clothing stores to high fashion house boutiques like uh, designers like Cynthia Rowling. If you can't decide between books and fashion, Bookmark, an independent bookstore launched by Mark Jacobs, offers both hard to find books and Jacobs accessories. As you exit across the street, the Heim Gross sculpture, The Family, comes into view, a gift to the city in honor of the service of Mayor Ed Koch. Only several doors away from the Heim Gross site on LaGuardia Place, pop into the Center for Architecture and explore three floors of exhibits and programming examining contemporary conversation in architecture and urban planning. This place is a reminder that while steep in history, the village remains a vital contemporary arts and culture center. As we will learn tonight, Hyam and Rini Gross represent compelling examples of the American immigrant story, who went on to contribute their many talents to their local community and adopted nation. This site allows us to inhabit, in a way, what life was like and continues to be like for so many creatives who choose to live and work in Greenwich Village and even in urban studios elsewhere. How artistic practice integrates with daily life and personal biography, and often when we talk about urban spaces and smaller urban spaces. While his uniquely intact studio provides special insight into the physical processes of art making, it's clear at the core when you are there that Gross cared deeply about family and that this was a family home, lived in and personal. As a former curator, it is also a sheer joy to experience such a thoughtful example of an artist as collector and curator. He clearly loved the object and is therefore a curator's dream, as I'm sure Sasha, I see her shaking her head. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sasha, for helping us to understand the multi-layered aspects of this rich site its spaces and collections, and the fascinating people who lived here. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mackenzie and Valerie, for that wonderful introduction. 
Um, and also thank you to Lavona and Peter for interpreting for us today. We're, we're so grateful for your, for your assistance. Um, I've been enjoying this program since it started and during the COVID-19 closure, and we're, we're really grateful to be participating um, this season. So I'm thrilled to welcome you uh, virtually to the Rini and Heim Gross Foundation. Um, as Valerie said, my name is Sasha Davis and I am the foundation's executive director. And our mission is to preserve and interpret the historic home, studio and art collections of the 20th century sculptor, Heim Gross. Um, we also have the mission to further uh, both Heim and his wife Rini's legacy through high quality research exhibitions and public programming centered around our building and collections. And we would like to acknowledge that our building is located on the ancestral land of the Lenape people. We acknowledge the displacement of the area's original inhabitants and the diaspora of the Lenape people that continues today. So as I transition now to talking a little bit about the artist Heim Gross, um, I'm inviting you to kind of look into his space, into his studio, um, and tell you about what he was known for, which he was known as a direct carver in wood, although he also worked in bronze and stone. He was a passionate collector of other artists' work, a lifelong educator, and also a consummate printmaker and draftsman. His life spans the bulk of the 20th century um, and he and his wife, Rini, purposefully left their home and collections as a private operating foundation for the public to better understand the lives of artists in New York City during the 20th century. Uh, Gross was born in 1902 in what was a very small village called Velova, near to a larger town called Kalamea in the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, this area, known as Galicia, was at the time part of Austro-Hungary, but is now in Ukraine. The family was Jewish. They followed uh, Hasidism. He was the 10th child born to his parents, although only five reached adulthood due to illness. His father was a timber appraiser, which might account for Gross's particular affinity for working in wood. World War I completely uprooted the family. Um, this particular area had a lot of um, violence. Uh, Gross was separated from his family during the war and was actually pressed into service um, by the Austrian army and he had to bury bodies on the battlefield. Um, he was able to escape from that situation and he returned to Kalamea at the war's end. Uh, from there, he went to uh, Budapest. Um, here he is shown in this photo from taken in Budapest in 1919. Um, Chaim Gross is on the right, his brother Abraham is in the middle, and his brother Pincus is on the left. Uh, so Gross originally went to Budapest to study goldsmithing and silversmithing, um, but was doing a lot of drawing on napkins. And by presenting these to the um, school, that, the art school that was there, he was given a um, highly competitive place to study with the painter Bela Utz. Um, unfortunately, he was only in the school for several months um, before there was a regime change in Hungary. Um, and he was unfortunately expelled and sent um, out of Hungary. And eventually he began to study art again at um, the, Kunst, the Kunstgewerbe Schule in Vienna. However, um, by this time, he understood that it was time to leave Europe. Um, one of his older brothers uh, had left and gone to the United States. And he did take a lot of these drawings with him, um, these drawings that were made in Europe. So on the left, you see the old Jewish cemetery. This was drawn uh, from the landscape in Kalamea, and on the right, a view of Budapest. So these are part of the portfolio that Gross carried with him um, on his journey to the United States. So in 1921, uh, Gross and brother Abraham left. Um, they arrived at Ellis Island and were assisted by HIAS, which is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society um, in finding lodgings and um, other resources in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, Gross immediately found classes at the Educational Alliance Art School, which you are seeing on your screen now. 
Um, this was not only an art school, but an organization that served as a Jewish settlement house. And so they also had um, many other resources for new immigrants. And they continued to serve immigrants on the Lower East Side and other surrounding community members. So Gross immediately befriended the painter Moses Sawyer during his first class. Um, and he remained one of his closest friends throughout their lives. Uh, the photo of Sawyer and Gross from 1922 is shown on the left, and on the right is a larger group of Educational Alliance friends that includes Gross, uh, the artist Peter Bloom, the artist Elias Grossman, um, the artist Leo Jackinson, and also their instructor, Abo Ostrowski. In addition to studying at the Educational Alliance, Gross also studied with sculptors Ellie Nodelman at the Bose Art Institute of Design and Robert Laurent at the Art Students League. Nodelman's sinuous forms are often reflected in Gross's own work. When, you'll, when I show more of his pieces, you will see that. Uh, Nodelman was also a collector like Gross, um, but what's different about him is that he oftentimes would paint his surfaces, which is not what Gross would do. Um, the dancer, which I'm showing at the right, is in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's collection. It is from around 1918 or 1919 and is cherry wood painted with gesso and pigment. Uh, this is work um, by Robert Laurent on the right. Uh, and Gross first carved wood in his classes with Laurent at the Art Students League in 1926. Uh, Laurent was well known as a direct carver, um, and as I mentioned before, this work on the right, that's in alabaster. It's a bather and is from the Brooklyn Museum's collection. In Laurent's classes, Gross made wood sculpture first as relief panels, and then fairly small works in the round. These are only about, you know, and 10 inches, 12 inches high. Um, they're fairly petite. Um, and this method of starting relief and then working in the round was a method of teaching that Gross used himself. So direct carving, which I've mentioned now a few times, is a subtractive method of sculpture. It is very responsive uh, because it uses natural materials like wood and stone. And in the case of Gross and other artists of his generation, they were not using um, electric tools. Everything was entirely using hand tools. So you can imagine how time consuming and difficult this kind of work would be. So around the same time in 1927, Gross begins teaching at the Educational Alliance while also setting up his own little studio on 14th Street. He was focused on direct carving and wood, mostly doing um, female figures like the work on the left, um, mothers and children, or acrobats as seen on the right. Gross became known for his stylistic abstraction of the body, um, but also his choice of materials. He was using tropical hardwoods that had traditionally been brought in um, to the New York area and been used by furniture makers as opposed to fine artists. New York was um, a manufacturing hub, and there were a lot of, um, of these woods being imported at the time. Um, this photo from 1938 shows Gross choosing logs um, with a man named Monteith Dayton, who worked, um, or I think was might be owner at some point, of Monteith Lumber, one of Gross's favorite lumberyards. And there were quite a few lumberyards like this in the city at that period of time. So Gross did not stain, he did not paint his wood sculptures. Um, so he was seeking out woods that had dramatic changes in color, grain. Um, he was also looking at various shapes of, of logs. He was also using boards and blocks because they gave him some kind of creative limitation and could be very interesting, very planar. Um, he did not glue or assemble pieces together. And his favorite wood was a wood called lignum vitae. And that is the hardest, densest wood um, available that you can find. And its name means tree of life in Latin. Uh, this particular photo shows him working on a sculpture in lignum vitae. He also liked to use woods like mahogany, ebony, cocobolo, and rosewood. 
Many of these woods were imported from Central America, the Caribbean, South America, and also Africa. One of these early key works uh, for Gross is the sculpture Happy Mother, which I'm showing in this photo here. It was sculpted in 1931 and is in Circassian walnut, which is a type of walnut co that comes from the Caucasus as opposed to a North American uh, walnut. The photo is by one of his very close friends, um, the well-known photographer Arnold Newman. Uh, Gross has deliberately left the tool marks on the sculpture surface. So this is a finished sculpture, but you can see um, both in person and also um, in the photograph that there's a lot of texture on the surface. And that's to show the hand of the artist that it was made by a person and not a machine. He has also flipped the log to be horizontal as opposed to vertical. Um, creating this dynamic tension where he's balanced the entire sculpture on this very narrow um, little base in the middle. And that's all the same piece of wood. And Newman was, was a wonderful storyteller in his photos. So you see that Gross's hands are visible, once again, showing the hands of the artist. So in many ways, Gross was in constant dialogue with the city once he was um, living in New York starting in 1921. Uh, throughout his life and career, uh, he was drawing from life, often in public parks. Um, he was also inspired by the people that he saw who populated the city. Um, and as a primarily figurative artist um, of the human form, um, he would love to see the diverse mix of city dwellers. So one of these well-known sculptures um, is East Side Girl, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. So it can be seen on view in New York. And it shows um, a lower East Side Girl. This is not an Upper East Side Girl, Lower East Side Girl, um, dressed as a flapper. So she has a cloche hat, a skirt. She's also kind of stepping off of her pedestal. So she appears to be in motion. Another very early key work for uh, Gross was the Lindbergh family, which is this totemic columnar uh, narrative sculpture that responded to the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. This was carved in 1932 in Golden Street, Eaglewood. Um, a little baby figure can be seen at the top, but each shape within the sculpture has a specific meaning. Um, so although Gross frequently used universal themes in his work, um, he did do a certain number of works that were very responsive to contemporary events. And a lot of times those are stylistically different. Um, in this case, it's much more abstract. I would now like to introduce Rini, um, who is not only Heim Gross's wife, but also one of these forces that helped create the foundation and um, allowed it to be what you see today. So in 1929, Gross met Rini Nachin, uh, she was born in 1909 in what was at the time the Russian Empire, but is now Lithuania. Uh, she immigrated to the United States uh, actually the same year as Haim did in 1921, um, but with her family. Um, she was a little bit younger and her family settled in Brooklyn. She studied literature at Brooklyn College and um, when the two of them met, it was one of those very sort of instantaneous connections um, however, Chaim Gross was an impoverished artist and was not really in the position to support um, Rini or a family. Um, so they didn't actually get married until the end of the year in 1932. Uh, so Rini not only served as Gross's primary model and muse, um, she was also a passionate activist and she, she was very political. And she later assisted in managing a lot of the aspects of Gross's career as they became more complex. Um, they had two children, which uh, you can see them both in the photo on the right. Uh, so son Yehuda and daughter Mimi, um, both of them continue to be involved with the foundation today. So in many ways, 1932 was this very key um, banner year for Gross. In addition to marrying Rini, um, he also had his first solo show at 140, Gallery 144. Um, he exhibited uh, 30 wood carvings and one stone sculpture. Um, and it was very well received. And in the catalog introduction, we have this quote um, from the sculptor, William Zorak, um, calling Gross 
Gross's work, Spirited, Youthful, and Alive. So Gross benefited and really survived as a result of a number of New Deal arts programs. Rini actually remembered in one of her oral histories that they only survived the Great Depression due to these commissions. <clears throat> so one work that I'm showing here is a stone relief um, of riveters, and that's on the exterior of the Federal Trade Commission building in Washington, DC. So you might have to backtrack, but theoretically you could visit this on a road trip as well. Uh, he also completed um, a number of projects for the World's Fair in 1939 and 40 in New York. <coughs> One was a live carving demonstration, which um, meant that he was visible in the public for a period of over four months. Um, visit, visit, visitors not only watched him work, but also had conversations with him and apparently heckled him because his ballerina didn't look realistic. Um, you can visit the sculpture now. It is on view at the Brooklyn Museum. And I'm going to show a short video now. Um, but Gross's interest in the sort of educational demonstration seen in the World's Fair um, sort of continues uh, throughout his life. So this is the film, or excerpts from the film, Tree Trunk to Head, um, which was directed by scholar, photographer, and filmmaker, Louis Jacobs. Um, the film itself is 27 minutes, silent, black and white, and it can be watched on our website. Um, through the Films tab under Heim Gross or by going to our Vimeo page. Uh, this film was shot at 63 East 9th Street, um, which was Gross's studio from 1930 until 1953 when the building was torn down. Um, he starts by sketching first on paper um, from his live model, Rini. Um, then he transfers that to the block of wood using chalk. Um, he's examining it. You can see he's hefting it, moving it around. Uh, this particular wood is called sabaku wood. And then he starts the chiseling process. So here he has a mallet in one hand, a gouge or a chisel in the other hand, um, and he's removing large amounts of wood at once. Um, once he has um, as much taken out as he wants to using those tools, he then turns to his next tool, which is a rasp. Um, and a rasp um, basically erodes the surface and removes, removes wood, but smooths it out as well. Um, and then finally, um, after he's done with that process, he would seal the wood um, using something called a French finish and then a thin coating of wax. And Gross actually believed that floor polish, floor wax was actually the best kind of wax to use on a wood surface um, because it did not collect dust. And um, if you watch this film in its entirety, you'll, the, the ending is quite fun because you get to see Rini and the finished sculpture compared to one another. And this is it now in the foundation's collection. So during World War II, Gross served in the city reserve patrol, which was a volunteer position. Um, here he's shown in his uniform with his family. This is 1944. And the photographer is Marion Palfi, um, who I like to mention because she's a very interesting uh, social documentarian uh, who fled the Nazis during World War II and was one of many, many artists who came to New York at this time and really um, amplified and enlivened the artistic community of New York. Um, here I'm showing a self-portrait on the left um, and then on the right, um, another photograph that she took of Gross, um, this time teaching at the Educational Alliance. And she actually followed him around and, and photographed him both in the studio, at work, and at home. And this was for this project that she was working on called Great American Artists of Minority Groups. Uh, so she chose Chaim um, to sort of represent um, the, the Jewish group, which, uh, but they actually stayed friends. And she went on to do quite a few other really interesting projects as well. So Gross um, put all of this immense knowledge of wood sculpture into his book, the 1957 publication, The Technique of Wood Sculpture. 
Uh, he goes into a lot of detail about methods and materials. Um, he also talks uh, sort of theoretical, um, you know, what he's trying to achieve in his work and also gives examples of sort of the, the best of wood sculpture across the globe. So his examples include uh, works from ancient Egypt, um, historic African figures, Northwest Coast Native American works, medieval Christian saints and Madonnas, um, and also Chinese polychromed figures. So he's quite diverse in um, his examples, but he really valued um, wood carving for the um, methods and also just the, the, sub, the structure, I guess you could say. And there are many quotable passages from this book. It's hard to choose just one, but I think this one is particularly helpful for understanding why he loves wood so much. He wrote, I like wood. I like to carve it and to judge how the work is going by feeling the carved surface. There is a satisfaction and pleasure in the sense of touch that establishes an intimate affinity with the wood. It is also a primary reason why I never use power-driven tools at any stage of carving of a carving. The use of my hands and the customary hand tools maintains the close contact with the wood I enjoy. Coexisting with this um, love of wood sculpture that he's espousing and, and teaching and, and really discussing in his life, um, Rose was also simultaneously really, really taken with experimenting in other mediums, including bronze casting. So in the 1950s, um, he moves beyond simply casting his wood sculptures in a bronze form. He instead becomes um, infatuated by modeling and plaster. And he develops these very slender open work forms. They're light, they're airy. They're very, very different from the very solid forms that you get in wood and stone. Uh, he traveled to Rome, Italy several times to work with foundries there. And this photo is taken in Rome in 1957, showing him at work on a plaster for the sculpture Bird's Nest. Um, he also frequently left the, the texture um, of the tool marks um, in his plasters. So those are also visible on the final bronze sculptures. And this is kind of similar to his work in wood. He wants you to see the artist's hand in that process. So in, when he spoke about the freedom that he had with bronze, he said, you know, wood has to grow up. Bronze can grow out. So there's a lot of flexibility there that he didn't have working with um, natural materials that were direct, directly carved. So Gross continued to work in bronze throughout the rest of his life while also working in other mediums. Uh, he created many monumental works, most of which were cast at the Beatty Mackey Foundry in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. They are still in business, so you can actually visit them or have your work cast there. Uh, the photo on the left shows Gross at work on a plaster of the family. Um, then this is taken in 1979. Um, as mentioned by Valerie earlier in the program, um, this bronze um, was given to the city of New York and placed in Bleecker Street Playground. So the photo on the right by Richard Allen Fox shows Rini with the finished sculpture. And this was taken um, in 1991. Unfortunately, it was installed just right after Heim had passed. Um, but at least Rini was there for the grand sort of presentation. So to go to the site, um, the foundation, um, we are located at 526 LaGuardia Place, which is just a block and a half south of Washington Square Park, as Valerie mentioned. Um, it is part of the South Village Historic District, so our facade is landmarked. And it's a very urban environment, but it has residential buildings, commercial space, um, and also had a lot of artist studios during the 20th century. There were, there even are a few artists still in existence on the block. Um, so there are some still left. So the Grosses purchased this four story brick building in 1962. And the idea was to create a space that could be both home and studio. Uh, previously they had lived and raised their children um, on the upper west side, kind of Harlem border. Um, it was at 30 West 105th Street, um, but Gross had always had a studio downtown. So he was always commuting down to the village to work during the day. This building was designed by the architect Joseph M. Dunn and built in 1873. It was a storefront on the ground level. 
and then had loss above. Uh, the photo that I'm showing here is by Lewis Hine and it shows the entrance um, in 1912. Uh, so you can see some of the cast iron um, is still intact as it looks today. Um, and the building was used for factories and industrial purposes, eventually becoming an art storage and moving facility called Berkeley Express. So the grossists used this company, were familiar with the building, and that led to their purchase of it. Gross worked very closely with the two modernist architects hired to work on the renovation. Uh, their names were Arthur Malson and Don Ryman. Uh, both Malson and Ryman decided to keep elements of the facade, including the cast iron detail that I mentioned previously, and also the metal soffit on the ground floor, and also the entablature at the roof line. Also, the, the brick basically higher up is, is kept as is as well. So to modernize the front, um, they added purple brick insets and large plate glass windows where large wooden doors had previously been, as seen in the hind photo. Um, they also created this um, vestibule area with a wrought iron gate um, and two entrances on the one on the left and one on the right. Um, so if you took the one on the right, um, you could go directly into a gallery and this would be easier for moving sculpture in and out. Um, and just to kind of point out, here's that purple brick in this photo as well, plate glass, and then the cast iron details as well. So here I'm showing two photos, um, snapshots really, taken by Gross in 1970 um, as he finished a roll of film <laughs> at the end of a trip. And the one on the left is looking north along LaGuardia Place. Um, the building 526 can be seen right here. And it's yellow painted as it is today. Um, and then on the right, we see from across the street, uh, the building's a little bit cut off, but you can see it here. Um, and you cannot see a tree there. Now there's a very, very enormous tree right in front of our building. So the building within was completely reworked by Malson, Ryman in conversation with Gross. Um, they built an industrial style metal staircase, um, stairwell, um, and also put in an elevator. Uh, previously there had been a pulley style elevator. Um, here I'm showing the blueprints for the renovation. Um, they did keep the floor plates intact, but that was really one of the only things that they kept the same on the interior of the building. So if you were to go in through the vestibule and you were to make a left and then come through, you would enter this very narrow space um, where you're seeing all these historical photos on the wall. This is how it was installed when the grosses lived here. They had this sort of gallery wall of photos. Um, and as you pass through this grouping of photos, you enter a door on the right and suddenly you go from a rather dark little space into this beautiful illuminated gallery um, with this studio to your left in the back of the building. So I'm just showing here the what it looks like. And I just wanna show you now, at least there's one key photo um, of this group that I think merits mention. And this is of Helen Keller touching one of Haim's sculptures. Um, so this is from 1939. Um, and this was a Sculptors Guild exhibition, an outdoor exhibition. Um, and Gross was their first uh, president. So as Keller is touching one of Gross's sculptures, um, there's this wonderful connection between that quote from Gross talking about how touch was so central to his work. Um, and this also is um, an extension in our work today. We have access programs where there is a very strong focus on the touching of sculpture. So once in the first floor gallery space, you would go move towards the back part of the building um, and see that the floor has been dropped down um, into the basement. So you have this double height studio space. Um, so in order to allow um, adequate light into the studio, uh, the architects pushed back the sort of back of the building um, right up to the property's edge, creating this in immense 25 foot wide skylight. Um, it's not a North Light studio, 
Um, it actually is west facing, um, but the light is very, very even, um, very filtered, perfect for working in. Um, photos from the one like I just showed you from today versus the historical photos um, show that the space has not changed very radically from 1980 until now. Um, the studio was a very active space and therefore always changing, um, but certain elements like the location of flat files and other furniture remains consistent. <clears throat> Here we can see sculptures in mahogany, ebony, alabaster, bronze. There's also a selection of drawings on the wall and these are sculpture studies. So sometimes they were done prior to making the sculpture or oftentimes afterwards. We can also pan along through the space and see how full it is. There's a lot of material in a very small space, yet because it's so tall, it seems like a very light and airy space. And here's some details of some smaller sculptures and portraits done in bronze. So I mentioned the drawings, how significant they were for Gross's work. Um, he drew both from life and from imagination. He recorded landscapes, but also um, his very surreal fantasy drawings. And this is Acrobat's Balancing. So a um, sketch of the finished sculpture on the left in charcoal, and then on the right, um, the Lignum Vitae um, piece uh, carved in 1938, um, which was used as sort of an illustrative work in the book, The Technique of Wood Sculpture with all these beautiful photos. So when you're in the studio, there's a lot of details I mentioned, um, including Gross's tools and materials. Um, in this photo, we see a workbench. Um, we see hack saws or hand saws, excuse me. We see mallets, we see gouges. Gouges are just rounded chisels and also coils of wire, which were used for making armature. So essentially the, the skeleton or supportive structure um, when you're working in plaster or clay. Um, and the last piece that Gross was working on before he passed um, is still in the vise. So that's in the bottom right-hand corner of the photo, the work um, that is still in progress. That is the last piece that he was working on. So if you were to stand here um, and turn around and 1965, this might be the site you would see. Um, you might see Gross on the stairs um, with the gallery behind him. So if you were to follow um, up the stairs and go back into the gallery, this is something that you would see, which is this installation of finished works. Uh, when Gross lived here, it was a lot more crowded. There were three or four deep, um, and a lot of times works were placed on fruit crates or other found objects and not on pedestals. So as you ascend the stairs coming from the gallery um, of works by Heim Gross, you are beginning to understand a little bit of his collection because you immediately encounter works by other artists installed throughout. Uh, the Grosses, when they lived here, rented out the second floor space. Um, so that's now our temporary exhibition space. And they lived on the top two floors. The third floor had the living room, dining room, and kitchen. Um, and then the bedrooms were on the fourth floor. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time in the second floor because it changes. Um, these photos are from our most recent exhibition, Artists and Immigrants, uh, which included over 100 works by over 50 artists. And this was really a celebration of Gross's um, immigration to the United States in 1921. So once we've gone up another level of, of stairs where you're surrounded by works, you enter into um, the private space of the Gross's personal collection. Um, we move things for very specific reasons, so loans, exhibitions, or conservation, but otherwise we try to keep as much of the space looking as it did historically as possible. There are no labels on any objects, um, and the walls are not white, they are a pale textured gray. And this was Gross's choice, he believed modern art looked best on a gray wall. So here we are seeing the living room, sort of looking um, southeast. And the third floor was 
both simultaneously a private space, but also a very much a public space as well for friends, of course. Um, it was social in that you would have salons, parties in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, this was an excellent location um, or jumping off point before going to the galleries in Soho. Um, and Gross felt very comfortable in the space because he felt that he was surrounded by friends even when they weren't physically there because the art made by them was surrounding him. Uh, so here um, is a photo from the Gross's 50th anniversary party. So this was in, in 1982. And Gross is seated. He's got his hand on a friend. Um, but there's other people in this photo like uh, Rebecca and Raphael Sawyer um, and Arnold Newman. So this was a very big event um, in Rini and Heim's later life. Um, and then also behind them, the a lot of these works are in the same locations now as they were then. Um, so there's a de Kooning, Willem de Kooning drawing over here on the side, Reginald Marsh drawing here, and then these plants have not moved either. These are still alive and, and thriving at the foundation. So this is a 1965 photo showing the living room's south wall. So I just had you looking at the east wall and now we've turned to the south wall. And we see <clears throat> that if you were to go today, many of these works remain in the same locations. There are paintings by Andre Deron, Jose Clemente Rosco, Raphael Sawyer, Abraham Walkowitz, Federico Castillon, and others. And if you were to look at this space in 65 and then move 20 years later, you would find that a lot of the works are still in similar locations. Um, however, the grosses did move things around. Um, they were dynamic individuals and they had the idea that this foundation should also not keep things static exactly. And that as long as the spirit of the installation remained the same, that was fine. Um, so now after we looked at the south wall of the living room, I'm turning another 90 degrees to the west wall. And this is kind of a shortened wall here. <clears throat> and we're seeing paintings by uh, um, other artists, including John Graham, Theodoros Stamos, Marsden Hartley, Raphael Sawyer, and Louis Michel Oshemius. Um, there's some sculpture by Han Gross, as well as an Ebo um, Maiden Spirit Mask from the African Arts Collection. There's also an eight track player um, as the grosses loved music. Turning to the North Wall, I have another historical shot from 1965 showing um, paintings by Milton Avery, Emmanuel Manny Katz, Stuart Davis, Philip Evergood, Roberto Mata, uh, two by Roberto Mata, uh, Max Weber, Moses Sawyer, and Joseph Stella. And these works might have moved from different walls, but some remain exactly as they did. For example, this Milton Avery portrait of Heim Gross working. Uh, so I mentioned it was social, but it's also a private space as well. Uh, Gross often sat in this exact easy chair when he was sketching in the evenings, um, drawing from both his imagination and from the objects surrounding him. So if you were to kind of stand in the living room and then point yourself down that hallway, um, you see that it's quite wide and it's quite long and you're looking at the very end, which is the dining room. And along this hallway, as I'm calling it, um, it's you see a number of bookcases, um, a number of other pieces of furniture um, full of books and also works from the African and Oceanic collections. So Gross began collecting African art in the um, late 1920s, but be only became serious about it in the 1930s, I would say, although he was very passionate early on. Um, he was guided by the important artist and figure of the New York mid-century scene, um, John D. Graham. And Gross purchased from a variety of sources, um, galleries and auction houses, um, mostly in New York. Um, however, he did purchase works as well um, when he was traveling. So um, certain locations in Europe, 
um, but also when he was in Africa in, and traveled to a few countries in the mid 1960s. And we, the sketchbooks that he produced during this trip are fantastic. Um, they can be accessed through the archives of American art. Um, and this case here um, is if you were look, looking back down this hall, it's right here in this reflection. And then you see this case here full of books and pieces of African sculpture. So I can't show you all of the works, but I will show you this sort of brief little pass through a few areas within the case. Um, so here, these are Abeji. These are twin figures um, from the Yoruba people. Um, also um, in this group, there's a Dan mask on the wall. There's also a very nice um, Teke figure. The installation is quite dense. Um, originally, there were more pieces that were out on other surfaces. So this has become um, a lot sort of richer or more dense, like I said, over time. Um, so here we, we continue down a little bit farther west um, into the dining room. Um, and once you are in the dining room, you will see there are um, a lot more works on paper. Uh, so we've got here drawings and paintings um, by David Berliuk, Marc Chagall, Pablo Picasso, Fernand Leger, Marie Laurencin, Charles Scheeler, Auguste Rodin, and daughter Mimi Gross, who did the um, irises in that top right corner. Uh, and also in the dining room, there is a very visible section of the art history library, although this continues throughout the entire third floor. And this is very helpful for seeing the books that Gross was um, referring to. And we also welcome scholars or interested people to come use our library today. So if you are curious, please consider that. So Heim Gross lived um, at 526 LaGuardia Place from 1963 until his death in 1991. Rini lived here until she passed in 2005. Uh, luckily, the foundation was formally incorporated um, prior to both of their passing. Um, it was incorporated as a nonprofit in 1989. Um, so it has their very intense um, intentions within it. Um, all of the aspects of it were thought of ahead of time when they were both still alive. Um, so after Haim passed, Rini opened um, the foundation to the public. Uh, she welcomed people to both the first and the second floors. So with the second floor, she transformed it into a uh, temporary exhibition space that mostly showed bronzes by Heim Gross. And really, um, I would say family efforts have continued to allow this to um, be a public space um, and available for people to visit. So if you would like to visit us in person, um, I think the best place to do, best place to do that is to go to our website, um, we have house and studio tours that are offered from the week after Labor Day um, until the end of June. Um, so we are not open in July and August, so you can't visit us today, um, but very soon. Um, you must book a ticket in advance. Um, and if the times do not work with you or you're a larger group, you can always give us a call, send us an email. We're happy to work with you. Um, in addition to tours, we also um, do a lot of educational programming. Um, programs include lectures, panel discussions, film screenings, poetry readings. Um, and we also have um, our signature access program called Tactile Transmissions that serves people who are low vision or blind. Um, all of that information can be found on our website. And um, I would like to end with this quote um, by Heim Gross from our archives. And he said, I believe passionately in peace and order. To me, art is the most powerful force of order today. In collecting paintings and sculpture of contemporary artists, in understanding the truths, ideas, feelings, and attitudes of their work, I gain a measure of truth and meaning in my life, and in my life, my work. All right. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, Sasha. What a beautiful quote to end on. Um, thank you for sharing um, and for providing this 
really uh, fascinating deep dive. Oh, got a friend. Uh, <laughs> um, into the legacy of Rini and Haim and their home and, and the work uh, that, that Haim did and their life that they built uh, together, which is just so beautiful to see and uh, so obvious from some of the pictures you showed. Um, we are now going to move into the Q&A portion of today's program. Um, so our audience is welcome to add uh, their questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. But I will selfishly start with my own. Um, so your site has um, such an extensive and complete collection, both of uh, Heim's work and um, of works that he collected. Um, but I'm curious, where are some other places uh, that uh, folks can see his work specifically out in the world beyond your space? Great question. Thank you. Um, so the largest collection actually in a in a public collection is in the Hirshhorn Museum's collection. So that would be in Washington, D.C. And I always recommend Washington, D.C., if, if not New York, because there are also a number of works on view at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, mm -hmm. as well as that WPA project on the Federal Trade Commission building. Now, if you're in New York, um, his work is seen in a lot of museums. Um, including the works on view at the Brooklyn Museum and at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, there's also the wonderful works um, outdoors. So not just the family on Bleecker Street, um, but also there's quite a few pieces at different universities. Um, so, so Pace, uh, Fordham's Law Campus, um, sort of near Lincoln Center. Uh, there's a lot of work to be seen. It sounds like it. So you could um, go on your own Heim Gross tour just around mm -hmm. that general area and see quite a bit. It's amazing. Okay. Perfect. Um, a question from the audience here. Uh, did either of the Gross children pursue arts as a career? Yes. Yes. I'm very, I'm very happy to talk about that. Um, so I didn't go into it too much in depth, um, but Mimi Gross um, the daughter is an incredible artist. Um, and for anyone who's interested, I highly recommend you look at her website. And what's really remarkable about our foundation is we have a very large number of her works throughout her entire life. So we have the drawings that she was doing on the back of her father's drawings when she was a child, um, you know, little, little figures, um, all the way up to um, gifts that she gave her parents um, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so we are very, very lucky to have that. Uh, Mimi also serves as the board president. Um, so she is very um, closely involved with the foundation's activities. Uh, I don't know if she's on today, but but maybe she'll write in the chat if she's here. Um, but she's um, a really incredible supporter. Um, and just to mention too, we don't talk about Yudi as much, which is the son, um, but Yehuda is a retired engineer. Um, so there's also this three-dimensional thinking happening with him as well. Um, and he is the foundation's vice president. Incredible. That's awesome that um, the family is so closely involved and that this whole foundation um, was planned while both Rudy and Heim were, were living, which from my understanding is oftentimes not the case for many artist foundations. Awesome. Thank you. Um, oh, kind of an interesting question here. Um, so different sources uh, provide two dates of birth for Heim Gross, 1902 and 1904. Um, and this person is wondering if there were two years added when he entered the U.S. Um, in 1921. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we didn't actually solve this problem until relatively recently. I think it was actually one of our volunteer educators, Madeline, who pointed this out, that there was this discrepancy. And I had always known 1904 as the date that Haim was born. Um, however, we ended up finding his original um, birth certificate and, and paperwork showing 1902. Um, and we couldn't find an exact date at which this changed. Um, however, in having conversations with the family members, I learned from Yudi, the son, uh, that what happened was Gross, as a young artist, was applying to um, some kind of prize, and apparently he wasn't young enough. So he shaved oh. two years off of his <laughs> birth year, but then he, he kind of got stuck with it. So 1904 then stuck. Um, but it, it's interesting because we're we're constantly learning new information, um, and that's one of the the benefits of having you know a very large archive is we can actually do the deep dive and do the research and and figure out the answer. Yeah, that's incredible. I guess to follow up to that, um, does the foundation um, keep as part of your larger collection 
I'm not sure if they're diaries or writings, things like that. Is that part of um, your larger archive? Yes, we do have a very large archive. Um, Heim Gross was not a diary keeper in sort of the sort of classic sense, um, but he was a very good record keeper as to his own work and the works that he was collecting. Um, so we have very, very strong provenances um, for the works in the collection and, and where they were sourced from. I guess uh, there's a similar question maybe to follow up on that in the chat. Um, wondering about um, the sculptures that were collected, especially like from Africa, Oceania, it sounded like maybe uh, Native American art was also an inspiration um, and wondering where those maybe were sourced um, and if any of them have been repatriated um, if challenged. That's a good question. Um, we haven't had any repatriation challenges yet, but however, one of the big um, sort of focuses of the last year or so has been trying to get more information about these collection objects. So we had a really fantastic uh, pre-doctoral fellow from NYU this mm -hmm. past year, um, and her name is Anne Holmuller. Um, she's working on her dissertation now, and she was really focused on the conversation in Paris museums and specifically in France around repatriation. So we had her basically spend an entire year looking into all of our information and trying to come up with not only best practices, but also trying to get as much information as possible. Um, so the works that the grosses collected later, we have a lot of information about, we have receipts, but in the sort of the earlier collected pieces, there really is not a lot of information. So would, this would is this be like the 1930s, 1920s? Sort exactly. Of time era. exactly. So it's an, it's an ongoing and evolving conversation. And if someone wants to follow up with me about it more, you know, I'm very happy to talk about it as well. Um, you can find my email address on our website. Thank you so much. Um, a question from the audience about the design for the soft lighting um, around the art walls. It's a really uh, interesting feature of the building. Um, was that part of the original design? Yes, I'm actually going to go back to this photo just so I can show show people if, if, they, if they happen to miss it. And I didn't mention it before, um, but this is actually Heim Gross's lighting design. So this was oh, his cool. vision for what he wanted. Um, it is a little bit darker than a typical gallery. So, so sometimes visitors will comment that they're having trouble seeing the work, um, but you just have to kind of understand that that, that was like the vision that the Grosses had. Mm -hmm. um, we recently um, did a project where we switched out all of these incandescent bulbs to um, LEDs. And it was a very difficult problem because the, um, LEDs on the market, it's hard to get exactly the right tone, colors, or clarity to match, um, to the, the, match the original incandescence. And you have to imagine this is, if you were to go up into that sort of cove molding and look at it, it's basically just like a an incandescent bulb placed every, you know, six or eight inches or so. So it's almost like makeup mirror lighting. Um, and Gross also was working with architects at a time in the 60s when um, fluorescence for all the rage. So we also have fluorescent bulbs and, and sort of fluorescent tubing um, in certain areas of the foundation as well. And those- oh, wow. That um, still remains there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> wow. and, and once, at some point they will be switched out for LEDs and we're, we're starting to do that process, um, but those ones have a little bit longer of a, of a life than the incandescents, which um, were problematic because they went out so often. Yeah, I bet. It's uh, just the structure and the molding around is just so beautiful. It's a really unique feature of the home. So cool. Um, I think we are kind of getting here to the end of our hour. So I just want to close this out. Thank you, Sasha, so much for um, uh, giving some of the incredible answers and a beautiful presentation um, about your site. I can't wait to hopefully visit in the, the one day near future. Um, and of course, thank you to Valerie um, for also sharing her time, energy, and expertise in this presentation series. It is such a, a privilege to partner with you on this uh, program and continue this good work. Um, and, and of course, with every site that is a partner to us on the virtual road trip, it's so fun to travel to all these spaces. Uh, I also want to thank Lavona and Peter for providing ASL interpretation and helping us make this program more accessible. Thank you so much for being here with us um, month after month. I know this is a lot of interpretation work, so we appreciate you. 
Uh, for those of you remaining, I have added uh, links to the chat, uh, to resources, websites, mailing lists, playlists, um, and upcoming presentations. Um, so you can continue your exploration of the Rini and Heim Gross Foundation, Haas, the James Castle House, and all the sites that we visited, um, not only on this year's road trip, but on years past uh, through these links. As a reminder, this presentation uh, has been recorded and will be made available in the coming days, and it will be available on YouTube. Uh, so next month, we actually conclude our 2023 virtual road trip um, at the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York, not so far away from uh, our site today. Um, so we hope that you will join us then. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone, and I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Great. Bye.